Well, here we are. Uh, I'm with uh, Michael Sandel, one of my favorite uh, people and writers and a great professor of philosophy at Harvard, but uh, also uh, a master really at, in the classroom and at the national and the international level of what I would call a Socratic conversation. Uh, he has a way of engaging with people in his books and uh, in a room and online. Uh, which I don't think anyone else can do. And it, it, it allows people to talk to each other in a way that they don't normally do. And this, this new book of Michael's, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. I, I read it. Uh, I love it. Uh, uh, I think that, and I, I've said this to Michael, that a lot of us have nibbled around the corners or the edges of this subject in our books. But I think we've all been waiting for somebody to actually write the T, capital T, capital H, capital E, the book on the subject of what's wrong with meritocracy as a concept of society. And um, so first, Michael, I mean, is this a book that was sort of grinding away in you for decades or what made you suddenly do this one? Well, thank you so much, John, for those uh, generous words of introduction and, and uh, about the book. The book was really prompted by trying to make sense of the political upheavals that began in 2016, with Brexit in Britain, the election of Trump in the United States, and the populist backlash against elites that we saw in democracies around the world. Yeah, all over the place, yeah. And it, it seemed to me that, that underlying the, the populist backlash, the embrace of, of, in many cases, xenophobic, strident, stridently nationalistic, authoritarian figures, were a set of resentments and grievances that we needed to try to figure out. Now, a lot of those grievances had dark and ugly features, xenophobia, racism, misogyny and the like, anti-immigrant sentiment. Right. But entangled with these ugly sentiments were some legitimate grievances worth taking seriously, uh, having to do with four decades of a market-driven globalization that left many working people behind. Not only did inequalities of income and wealth deepen over the past four decades. But we saw changing attitudes towards success and failure. Those on top came to believe that their success was their own doing and that they therefore deserved the benefits that a market, uh, the market bestows on the successful. And by implication that those that those left behind must deserve their fate as well. This attitude towards success, I call it meritocratic hubris, yes. I think is a big part of the sense among many working people that elites are looking down on them. So, so I mean, I think this idea of meritocratic hubris is really uh, amazing because of course we all know about aristocratic hubris or dictatorial hubris or movie star hubris but the idea that people uh would damage society by uh, uh, uh being theoretically the best educated the best whatever right. um but in fact they're adopting a, a concept the self-made man which was really not attached to that at all i mean it came out of a completely different history it's as if they grabbed hold of that old idea, I'm a self-made man, I can do what I want. And they were saying, I'm a self-made man, but I'm, you know, PhD, brilliant, I'm an expert, I'm this, and I can do what I want. It's right. a strange coming together of those, those two tr traditions. I mean, yeah. two stories. Yeah, there, there, is, there is something in one way deeply attractive, even inspiring about the meritocratic idea that so long as chances are equal, those who work hard and cultivate their talents deserve the rewards their talents bring. There's something inspiring about that because 
it suggests the need to put everyone on a level playing field before the meritocratic uh, competition begins. So that's the allure, that's the appeal. And it's connected, John, to what you've just described as the, the image of the of self-making that goes with it. It's, it's almost an, an exhilarating idea of freedom, really, that if conditions are equal, we can all rise as far as our efforts and talents will take us. And if we do, if we manage to land on top, we will be able to say, I earned it. By dint of my own effort and talent, I earned it. The dark side is that by implication, those who don't flourish in a competitive meritocratic society must deserve their fate as well. They must have no one but themselves to blame. So the, the image of the self-making, self-creating, striving, rising subject of a meritocratic society, the winners, is it, it generates hubris among the winners, but it also promotes a kind of demoralizing sense of humiliation among the losers because it tells them, well, their failure it must be their own doing. And this, I think, is, is what's been happening to our societies as we embraced a kind of market-driven version of globalization together with this way of thinking about success and failure, this way of thinking about aspiration and rising. It's, it's poisoned our politics. It's driven a deep divide between winners and losers. And it's pulled our societies apart. And I think it's this way of thinking about success that has led those left behind by globalization, those whose wages have stagnated, those who struggle to find work or to make ends meet. It's, it's led them to, to the galling sense that meritocratic elites, credentialed elites, look down on them. I wonder, um, you know, in sports, the whole um, discourse around sports, uh, professional sports, is winners and losers, yeah. including the Olympics. And of course, at the end of the day, you have 5% um, winners and 95% uh, losers. Losers, you know. And, and it, it, I wonder, do, do you think that, the, that this hubris this concept was in any way inspired by the rise at the same period of professional sports and the adoration in every form of public uh, debate of what a winner is like versus a loser. Well, it's interesting. There does seem to be a, a quickening sense of adoration for winners, whether in celebrity life or in, in sports. But thinking about sports actually is, is a, an illuminating way of understanding the, the deficiencies, the moral weakness of the meritocratic idea of winning. The, the, Usain Bolt is the fastest runner in the world, the sprinter. He wins right, the right, gold, right. gold medal. Yeah. And we would all agree that he wins the race. He's the fastest runner. He deserves the gold medal. He has a partner, a friend and training partner, who wins the silver medal. He's not quite as fat. He's a gifted runner, but not as gifted as Usain Bolt. They train together. And Usain Bolt has acknowledged that his friend works harder, trains harder than he does. It's just that he isn't quite as gifted, naturally. But this raises the question, if winning the gold medal or landing on top in a meritocratic society is partly down to having gifts and endowments and talents that are not themselves our doing. Right. They're beyond the training. I could swim, practice swimming endlessly all day long and never defeat Michael Phelps in a swimming competition. 
if I could just add one other contingency, LeBron James is a great basketball player. Right. And he practices hard and he is gifted. But is it his doing that he lives in a society that loves basketball and rewards it? Or is that his good luck? Right. If he lived in, in the Renaissance, they didn't have much use for basketball players. They mm. preferred fresco painters. Yeah. So the fact that we live in a society that prizes the qualities or the talents we happen to have, that too is not our own doing, but our good luck. And meritocratic hubris forgets this. Uh, and, and so I think we need to be reminded of the contingency and the indebtedness of, for, for the talents we have, and above all, for the fact that we live in a society at a time that happens to prize ours rather than somebody else's. So I think that leads to the, the second part of, of what I want to say. Somewhere in the book, and I, I hope I get this right, I think you talk about, I believe it's the Middle Ages, where you're saying that at least you know, a serf or, you know, a peasant in the right. Middle Ages right. actually knew where they stood in society. Right. And they knew that that was for, for social political reasons. And that therefore they, uh, you know, if their lord was, wasn't a monster, they could actually have a conversation or he could insult him in some way because they both knew that they were there because that's where the class system had put them. Right. As opposed to, and so in a way, there, there was a, a bottom through which right. you wouldn't probably fall. Whereas if you were in a meritocratic society, it's a bottomless pit. Michael Young was on to this point. He's the one who actually coined the term meritocracy, a British sociologist in the late 1950s. And for him, meritocracy was not an ideal, not the definition of a just society. He saw it as a dystopia. And for just this reason, John, he, he saw that meritocracy would lead to hubris among the winners and a demoralizing sense of humiliation among the losers, because unlike aristocratic societies, those who landed on top would be encouraged to believe that they had done it on their own, by dint of their own effort, that they deserved their place. And that those on the bottom deserve their place as well. In an aristocracy, if you were born a serf, your life would be very hard, but it wouldn't be plagued by the thought that it was your own fault. And likewise, if you were born to be the lord of the manor, you would enjoy everything that went with that, except the conviction that you had earned it. Everybody knew that the accident of birth determined who landed on top and who on the bottom. Whereas in a meritocracy, Michael Young was onto this. That's not the case. And I think he glimpsed the dark side of meritocracy that has really unfolded in the present where the successful tend to inhale too deeply of their own success and look down on those less fortunate than themselves, creating the intense polarization that we see, John, in our politics today. I mean, the, you know, the, the thing that's amazing is if we were just talking about the business class, where after all, you know, the you know, if you're a capitalist, the reward is supposed to be the absolute reward and you get to build clubs and have yachts and whatever. Um, but we're actually talking about, you know, uh, professors of medicine. We're talking about, you know, the, uh, the best and the brightest. We're talking about people with enormous educations who are right. intellectually very, very smart. It, it's, it, it is, I, I, and I, I would really love to hear you kind of pick away at this problem of, uh, you know, we turn on the businessman for being self-centered and self-interested, but it seems amazing that these others with their enormous educations and so on have so little consciousness you know, the word, right? Consciousness of their impact on others right. and on society. That is, that is the astonishing thing. It seems so easy for them to fall into this um, and not understand what they had become. Right, it's very interesting, John, that you mentioned this contrast between the resentment 
that fuels the populist backlash against elites does not target business people. In fact, Trump is a wealthy real estate developer in Manhattan. He is he's the voice of the populist resentment, not its target. Right. And th this is a kind of puzzle. How can this be? Whereas, just as you say, it's professional elites, well-educated elites who are the target of this anger. And I think this gives us a clue to the tendency of the uh, of professional elites, meritocratic elites, well, the well-credentialed to feel a sense of achievement um, and of entitlement of dessert. And the, the key to this is the role that higher education has come to play as an arbiter of opportunity. It, it seems on the idealistic picture of meritocracy, if chances are equal, you can, uh, and if you can get into a university and get a good degree, then you can rise. That's the promise. But that casts universities as arbiters of opportunity in a society. Uh -huh. And that has fueled, I think, resentment and anger toward the universities, as well as the credentialed elites who exercise such cultural and also political authority. I mean, I suppose it's in a way the United States, it's not just because it's, you know, the most still the most powerful country in the world, but the fact that so many of those universities are pri private universities and it's yeah. the, the fees are enormous. And so the entrance into them is the entrance into a class system. Um, uh, so it probably exacerbates the, the problem in the States, I suppose. No, not try to overcome this, as you know, with uh, um, generous uh, systems of financial aid and scholarship for those who can't afford it. And the wealthiest of the uh, private American uh, colleges and universities have need blind admissions. Right, right. Uh, so that students are admitted without regard to the ability to pay. And those who are admitted are funded according to their financial need. And there is a, there is a, a, an idealism in this policy. And yet, and yet, even with these generous scholarship schemes and financial aid policies, there are more uh, students from the top 1% in Ivy League universities than there are from the bottom half of the country put together. Right. So, and this is despite the, the very generous policies toward those who can't afford to pay the fees. So this is a measure of the extent to which we fall short of realizing the meritocratic ideal. But then it's a further question, as we've been discussing, whether even if we could, even if there, even if the competition to climb the ladder of success, and this is the often used image, the ladder, even if those chances were truly equal, would that make for a just society? Would we say that those who clamored to the top rung deserved their place? One of the difficulties is by fo focusing only on or mainly on fair terms of meritocratic competition. Right. We focus on helping people uh, compete to climb the rungs on the ladder without noticing that the rungs on the ladder have been growing further and further apart over the past four decades. Right. And so there's a tendency to, to allow a preoccupation with individual mobility to distract, especially progressive parties, from focusing on the inequality itself, the rungs on the ladder growing further and further apart. So you know, there's, a, there's a question which I, I, I really want to ask you, which is the idea that everybody wants to and needs to want to rise as high as possible. Isn't that in and of itself an odd concept of how human society actually functions? Uh, yes, I think we should try to wean ourselves from precisely that assumption and focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition 
and focus more on enabling people to flourish where they are, where they live, uh, if they want to. Of course, we should remove barriers to achievement. No one should be held back based on family background, racial or ethnic prejudice, right, right. or class disadvantage. That's very important. But equality, true equality of opportunity and genuine opportunities to rise do not by themselves make for a just society or a good society for just the reason that you identified. We need to focus more on enabling people, even those who have not received a university diploma, who by the way are the majority of our societies in the US, in Canada, in Europe, the majority of adults don't have a four-year college degree. So it's folly to create an, econ an economy premised on the assumption that a four-year college degree is a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life. We should shift, I think, our, our public debate toward the question of the dignity of work. What would it take to enable everyone, those who aspire to go to university and, and rise, and those who aspire to flourish in place, how can we enable everyone to have access to dignified work and a decent life that enables them to, be, to contribute uh, through their work, uh, through their families, and in their communities? That should be our focus. And I'm afraid that the, the uh, too single-minded an emphasis on rising right. misses that. Well, let's just finish by talking a bit about you know the moral and the ethical questions and the democratic questions and i guess you know the, the the fundamental question is can you have a fully functioning meritocracy and a democracy at the same time it's doubtful that the two can go together we tend to think that the alternative to meritocracy is an aristocracy where people's place in life is fixed by the accident of birth. But it seems that today the, the real alternative to meritocracy is democracy, their intention. Because a meritocracy encourages those who land on top to believe that their success is their own doing. And this conviction this meritocratic hubris dampens their sense, the sense of the successful, that they are indebted for their success to the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, to family, neighborhood, teachers, community, country. The more I believe that my success is my own doing, the less likely I am to picture myself in other people's shoes. A lively sense of the contingency of our lot, an awareness of the role of luck in life, can prompt a certain humility there, but for the accident of fortune or the grace of God or the mystery of fate go I. So I think the antidote, John, to the meritocratic hubris that we've been discussing is a greater appreciation of luck and indebtedness among the successful, a kind of shifting of attitudes toward success. Because without an appreciation of my indebtedness, it's very hard to care about the fate of the common good. And that in the end is what democracy requires. Citizens who think of themselves as equals, deliberating about the common good, about what makes for a just society, about what we owe one another as citizens. And so I think that the sense of humility that comes from an appreciation of our indebtedness is the civic virtue 
we need now. It can begin, I think, to point us toward a less rancorous, more generous public life. Well, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. And I think that's exactly where we should end because it, it, it shows that the outcome of a merit, uh, meritocratic society um, doesn't lead towards democracy and that democracy right. itself requires this kind of inclusive citizenship. Right. So thank yeah. you very much, Michael. Great. Thank it's you, John. Great thank with you. You. And it's a wonderful book.